everyone. Thank you for joining us today for Literacy and Impact Technology. My name is Cheryl Gillahan. I am CEO and co-owner of Cause Labs, a public benefit corporation offering web services to nonprofits and social enterprises. I'm joined today by Kristen, with Kristen Walter, and she is the Director of U.S. Programs at World Reader. Um, I actually know Kristen from her previous position as the uh, Director of Education and Partnerships at Reading in Motion, and it's great to have you here with me today. Kristen, could you please tell us a little bit about World Reader, and then we'll, we'll dive a little bit into the technology and literacy portion after that. Sure, I'm happy to, and thank you for inviting me. It's a, a joy to be here and talk about two of my favorite subjects, technology and literature. Um, so a World Reader began in uh, 2010 as a global uh, global South literacy access uh, services with a mission to really support vulnerable and underserved communities throughout the world with digital reading solutions. Um, because as you know, a lot of technology in the global South did a big leap over landlines. And so there were cell services available and um, our CEO realized that we could provide an entire library in homes for uh, readers to access and improve their literacy skills. Um, so we've just launched the United States, which is incredibly exciting, and as response to COVID, actually, um, but we're continuing to add our services and continuing to grow here in the United States. But we really work with organizations to improve and, and to extend their impact and outreach um, through these digital reading solutions, and we help improve learning outcomes through workforce readiness and gender equity in initiatives. So very happy to be here and talk about that. Okay, so you've listed some very big topics that we're going to dig into a little bit. Um, first, I want to start with workforce outcomes. Um, and so you and I were talking not too long ago, and um, I was talking about Fort Worth specifically. That's where Cause Labs is headquartered. And I said that, you know, our city um, and our metro area was one of the contenders for the um, Amazon headquarters, the second headquarters. And um, we got passed up. And one of the issues, I think, was that uh, our workforce in 20 years wasn't going to be ready because the literacy levels of our students were pretty low. Um, and something else that I, I read and, and have heard recently is that until third grade, you're learning how to read. And then after third grade, everything is reading to learn. Right. And so if we can't read at grade level by third grade, then we're essentially behind. And that was a determination on whether or not we were going to have the appropriate workforce here in our city and in our metro area. Um, can you speak a little bit about how World Reader is trying to uh, impact that? Sure. Well, you know, as we know that literacy is an equalizer, it's, it's the equalizer across um, socioeconomic levels, accessing literacy skills um, allows a person to have mobility, upward mobility, social mobility. But really, when you are when you have advanced literacy skills, when you've gone beyond those foundational reading skills, and like you said, K one, two, three, we're re learning how to read. But after that, you really have to be able to read to learn. And if you don't have those foundational skills, your ability to comprehend and think critically about the text goes down. So when we are helping, you know, when we're using literacy as a tool for workforce readiness, we're really creating civic literacy. We're creating a, the ability for someone to engage with the society around them, um, with their government, with their with their ability to, to read, comprehend, and speak up um, on the issues that, you know, really mean something to them in, in their location. Um, but when we can provide texts in home and multiple texts at multiple levels so that a, a family can or a caregiver and child um, can start at one text, but then grow their comprehension and grow their ability to talk about the text, we're really contributing to this idea that we have a literate workforce, um, that we have someone who can read multiple texts or that are from multiple areas in the world um, and really look in, and comprehend and understand what's being said so that as they are entering the workforce, you have, you know, multiple levels of literacy that you can access, multiple, but also so not only do your job, but advance in your job um, to, you know, increase all those great things that we know about family outcomes and um, that kind of, those kinds of things. So one of the things that actually brought me to Cause Labs um, mm -hmm. was translation of text and translation, particularly of scripture in this project that brought me to Cause Labs. Um, but it was at that time, even though I have a background in linguistics and a background in translation, having done translation for the U.S. Army, um, I didn't know that there were, you know, 
over 7,000 languages in the world. Um, and it was just mind boggling to me, but there are a lot of actual languages that you don't consider when you're like listing off on your two hands, <laughs> you know, or your hands and feet, like how many languages can people really count? Um, and it was just fascinating to me. So cause labs, even to this day is very involved in, uh, translation, not actually the translation services, but making sure the technology can actually accept um, different kinds of texts like you were talking about. Um, and how does literacy, you know, language actually play into literacy? And it, tell me a little bit more about specifically the engagement piece of that. Sure. So, um, and I, I come from a, I have an education background, so taught in schools for almost 18 years. Um, and part of that was in a school with a very large second language speaking population for English, um, where Spanish was what the home language was for over half of the students that I worked with. And we really saw, and you know, and as education has evolved, those best practices around second language learning have evolved, that children really need to be able to read and write in their home language before they add a second language in. And so we are actually launching a Spanish collection um, along with our English collection, with our books of the week. I know it's very exciting and it, you know, June 1st is when that is happening, but with our books of the week so that children and their caregivers can have these conversations that go directly back to the text in the language that they choose. Because we also don't want to pigeonhole someone into a language or say that you speak English, so you have to read it in English, or you speak Spanish, so you have to speak in Spanish, but to give families choices so that if, say, the caregivers want to read in the home language, but the child wants to read in English, they still have a shared reading experience and a shared literary experience. Um, or if you know, both, both parties want to read in Spanish or both parties want to read in English, um, we think that's very, very important for children to be able to advance their oral literacy skills as well. Because if you're able to have these in-depth com conversations around what you're reading in the text, you're improving your comprehension skills around what you're reading. Um, but it really provides that multi-generational -gener experience around literacy. Um, so at World Reader, we, we have in the United States this bilingual collection of English and Spanish books with family engagement activities. Um, but as you know, we've worked around the world, so we also have the capacity to add books that we have in Arabic from our work in, in Egypt or books that um, you know, we've, we've done in other languages across you know, Africa or India. Um, so really it's meeting the needs of the reader where they are and then growing the reader or offering the reader choices as they advance in their skills. That is so. It's unique. Mm -hmm. It is. I'm trying to unmute myself. That is so great. Um, yeah, I was actually um, talking with someone not too long ago, and I told them, I said, uh, my mother, her first language is not English, but living in America, she had to learn English. And for me, she made sure that it became my first language that, you know, I, I learned English so that I could, you know, read to learn and, and excel and, and be where I am today. Um, and I'm incredibly happy and, and proud of that. Um, but for her, even to this day, she struggles with certain types of text. So she, she can read English, she understands English, but she struggles with metaphors. She struggles with pronouns. She struggles with poetry. I mean, there are just a lot of things that, that don't translate. Like she would prefer those in, in her own language. Right, absolutely. Well, and just even not losing your language, you know, losing the heritage of the language that you come from um, or that your family speaks, especially if you're in a multi-generational home where grandparents are speaking a, a, a language that's not English very strongly, um, but you still want to have these connected experiences with the children in the home. Um, so it is something that we, we think is incredibly powerful. Um, the other thing that I think is really unique about our collection is that it's global. So it's, you know, we have access to these languages, but they're authentic stories from different countries. And so one thing I've heard is in newcomer communities, um, the response we've gotten is that it's it's really great to read stories that are, feel like home. They feel familiar. You can you see words or see names or see pictures, drawn pictures of um, a country that you may have left to come to the United States. And in some of our more rural areas, well, it's a, a door and a window that we've opened. So suddenly you're seeing countries or words or names that you've never seen before. And so it's been really 
um, some really great conversations around names that children may not have ever heard before um, and are learning why it's important to know how to pronounce names correctly or important to know how to, um, why, you know, we don't shorten names that are, are new to us, that it's, you know, just as if someone were hearing your name for the first time. Um, so it's, the, it's been really the conversations I've been lucky enough to participate in have been very, very rich and have been just really neat on ramp for children to learn about either, you know, the a country where their parents or grandparents came from, or to learn about a completely new country that they, you know, if they don't have access to leaving their small area, um, that it's it's been a growing experience. The impact of that has so many different layers. It's just phenomenal. Awesome. And it, you know, just changes their lives for generations, you know, mm -hmm. after that. So that's fantastic. Mm -hmm. um, so you've talked a little bit about, you know, how it provides access and how it opens up you know, the conversations and really opens up a, a world of learning for them. Um, but we haven't talked specifically about the technology yet. Um, just a little bit of background and history on me. When I joined Cause Labs in 2010, I was fascinated by this, this translation project that I was working on and some of the um, discovery work that we were trying to do around the technology associated with that and, and how to actually make that happen on the other side of the world. Um, but technology itself, like, just really didn't fascinate me. I'm not the person that, you know, was tinkering with code when I was in high school, like some of our development team. <laughs> um, and so I didn't think for a long time that technology was a space I wanted to be in. And I thought, you know, do I just need to join a nonprofit and be like yeah. hands and feet in the mission, <laughs> like mm -hmm. a little bit more connected to the impact? Um, and it wasn't until, you know, a few years later being at Cause Labs and the various types of projects that we were working on, um, and a lot of them being education and literacy, that I realized that. Uh, the world just opens up when people have technology and this access and access was becoming so much more prolific with smartphones and tablets and Chromebooks and things that we were able to, you know, provide. And it was then that I realized that me being somewhere, you know, I might be able to like touch one person, one community, you know, my small impact of influence, you know, um, the technology allowed us to reach, I think by 2015, our, our various apps had reached 250 million people, which is, wow, <laughs> phenomenal. Right. Um, reading in motions mm -hmm. app kind of being counted in that number, you know, and so, and the number of students and the number of teachers and the number of families and the number of communities Mm -hmm. that can be impacted is just exponential. Absolutely. And so um, what I like, uh, you shared with me before, what I like about World Reader is that your platform's actually free and available. Mm -hmm. So talk a little bit about the technology that y'all are using there. Sure. So we, um, we, our CEO, David Risher, has this really great model of ABCD. So it's um, our, our whole entire collection is free to anyone that wants to use it. It's at bebooksmart.org. Um, you can pull it up and we'll actually have our, our premium collection for free during the summer to anyone as well. Not just our you know partners, but anyone can access our family engagement activities starting June 1st. Um, again, you know, just because we want to use technology for good, we want to help combat summer learning loss. Um, we want to provide these great reading experiences, but our, our A stands for accessibility. So the technology makes us accessible. It puts 400 books in the hands of a child on a mobile device. Um, you can download those books. You can read them on your cell phone. You can read them on a Chromebook, on a tablet, but you can take them with you anywhere um, and read them and access them. So if you have five minutes, you're at a laundromat doing your laundry, you can read a book and you're not having you know to, to carry this big bag with you. Um, but then the books are global. They're you know this global collection from 24 countries, 64 publishers from across the world, and not books that you would find anywhere else in the United States. Um, and I, that's something as a, a former teacher I really appreciate because you know I, I never want to limit someone's choice around what they're reading. Um, so we are able to provide these really rich, authentic texts and stories from around the world and open up books that, you know, that children would normally not have access to. 
And then we have this idea of using the technology. And this is my favorite thing. I think it's where the technology hits this crux of behavior change because we look at continuous engagement. How can we send messages that nudge a child or a family, you know, a, a mom or a dad or a caregiver to open the app and read a book? Or if it comes up and says, wow, you've read four books, congratulations. Or over the summer, the notifications are gonna say, can you read 15 minutes today? Um, can you hit a goal of 15 minutes? And so it's, it's constantly nudging depending on the path Path that your reader takes to, to help change your behavior so that you become a reader. Um, and then with our, we have partners that we partner with as well, in addition to this open collection, um, where we can provide them an, a data dashboard so they can see exactly what things they're doing outside the technology to change behavior. So if you have, you know, a thousand readers on a certain day, what were we doing with the technology and what were you doing outside of the technology to track that? So it's another layer of that continuous engagement, but that leads to our D, which is the data. Um, and I, I am, you know, from reading emotion, we use data all the time. I'm a big data believer in the data and that it helps tell a story, um, but it also helps you know what you're doing that's effective or not effective so you can pivot quickly and gather those readers or change that behavior that you're looking to change. Um, but I would say that, you know, just sort of in a nutshell, that's, that's how we use the technology, just that ABCD model, but it makes it facile, um, but it also opens up a larger collection for people to have access to. Mm -hmm. um, so Michael, the co-owner of Cause Labs, uh, he, when people say, you know, data is so detached from the human experience and then it's detached from people, he says, these are the footprints. These are people's footprints. This is what they're doing. And this is the experience, you know? Um, so data is so crucial. I agree with you. Um, what kind of data are you collecting on the engagement outside of the app itself? So outside the app, we work with partners um, who are, and I will say we work really well with partners who have an in-person delivery ser service, or an mm. in whether it's a social service of a food pickup or it, it's a shelter. Um, the fact that you can leave the shelter with this library on your phone, um, that you can access these books anytime, or if you have an in-person delivery system, or if you're a, a library or a, a bookstore and you're providing this service to your community, we help extend that service that you're offering because again, these are books that you wouldn't find in the country, so it's n not a competition. Um, and we don't, you know, we're not a, an organization that believes in scarcity. Like we have resources, we all bring our resources together and benefit the greater good of the community. Um, but outside, you know, if, if a partner is running a book club, you know, we can help them see how many children read the book that week, or um, if they are working on the shared community experience around a discussion of books, what books are the most popular? Um, we can look at what kind of books that your children are reading. If they're all reading, you know, really uh, beginner level books and you want them to move upwards, it's how, how, how can we help you do that? Or what are the books that children are finding most interesting if you want to just have, create a larger shared experience about reading? But we do at a, um, at a site level help our partners track how many readers they have at any given moment, how many books have been read, how many minutes readers are spending in the book. Um, what books are most popular? Our parents are able to, you know, our caregivers completing the activities so we can help track activities, um, which is a great, you know, way if you're having to report out on parent engagement, it's another, you know, a, another way to look at parent engagement. Um, so it's a multitude of, of things that we can talk about with, with partners outside the app around what's actually happening in the app and then what can we do together to help change that reading behavior. Mm -hmm. And it makes a difference in literacy success as Absolutely. well. Absolutely. Yeah. So you and I have both talked about just giving access to uh, literacy, literature, um, mm -hmm. technology, um, but accessibility is, is kind of a different conversation. And it's something that we are, I mean, we've done a, a little bit of that work in the past mm -hmm. um, with specific audiences, but not kind of on this broad scale that, really our government is having conversations about and it's going to become you know policy at some point where sites uh -huh. and apps and and technology has to be accessible to meet the various needs both seen and unseen challenges that people are having um, what kind of conversations are y'all having at uh, your organization related to that um, I think we're having the same conversations that you know that you just mentioned that it's the right thing to do to be accessible to everyone um, but also it's it's something that's gaining more um, it's gaining more 
as the expectation, like this is what, if you're going to be an organization, like you are going to need to be accessible to all, to all learners. And so um, being on the app, we do have the translation services. Um, you can, you know, set the app, the app language, not necessarily all of the book to, to your home language, um, but also thinking about read alouds, like how are our read alouds structured in a way that if you are someone who is um, sight challenged, that you can hear the book, um, and, and that it's being read to you in an appropriate way. And that's very different sometimes than just the read aloud you would check out from, you know, online or from a, a recorded book. Um, so we want to make sure that we're doing those things the right way. Um, we've talked about even externally, if we're, you know, working with a partner um, and they need to have the, say, the teacher training be accessible, are we meeting the needs of that partner? So we're looking at it in a couple of different ways, not just in the app, but also in our services and our support um, to make sure that we're meeting the needs of all of our learners. Yes, even for our events. And of course, mm -hmm. this being live right now, um, we don't have the closed captioning turned on because we don't right. have someone scribing. Um, however, when we record these and we post them later on, we do add closed captioning to them to try to make them a little bit more accessible. And sure. we provide transcripts for screen readers. And so doing our best even in, in events that we're hosting as well. Sure. Um, Another application that we were working on recently, uh, a web services uh, program for the state of California, we actually realized that we needed to do a lot of iconography. And so not only, you know, simplifying the language and making it a great, easy user experience, but actually trying to uh, create icons for the the core filters and the common things that people would actually be searching for um, in case the language doesn't quite translate for them. You know, they've got an image or a picture that they can relate with. Absolutely. So, and I think that helps for young readers as well when you're using visualization. So. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And a lot of our books, you know, we have a, um, a leveled system where we do start with our youngest reader. Um, we have some decodable texts. We're adding more as we go out throughout, you know, as we develop and grow our library. Um, right now, we're, we're mainly geared for read aloud, so a child being read to, but we do have some of those decodable, accessible texts. But um, we also have several books without words. Um, just, you know, again, it's that visualization. It's being able to retell a story that's, that is super important. So, you know, if you're a parent and you have um, less access to your own literacy skills uh, and there are words in a story that you're unsure of or you're unsure, and I hope no one is ever unsure of reading to their child, but if, you know, that's the case, you can still do a picture walk through the story and talk about the sequence of the story because sequencing is a, you know, a fantastic skill for children and then have them retell the sequence to you or tell what they see in the book and how, how are those visuals bringing the text alive. Um, so it is visualization, I would say, is a very big part for young children, but that iconography is super important because we all speak in this, you know, we letters are sound to symbol correlations. You know, we all have that symbol. You know, we start with the symbols early on. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, are you partnered with any school districts right now or is there any, any hope or, or future for that? Absolutely. So we do work in schools. Right now we're working with nonprofit partners, additional partners um, who service schools. So we uh, work with reading partners. We work with raising a reader. Um, we work with World Vision. Uh, and the, all of those have school sites that we work through, but it's definitely um, something we're open to and something that we're looking into being partners directly with schools. Um, when possible, again, because of because of the technology, it gives you this facileness to work at multiple levels um, and really meet the needs of of the readers that you're working with and the communities you're working in. Mm -hmm. And so we always tell people, you know, technology is not a one and done thing. It's not like you build it and it's like there forever. <laughs> you have to constantly maintain and support and enhance right. and um, you know, change and adapt with the way people are using technology. And so how, how are you, maybe not you directly, but your team <laughs> managing the sustainability of the application that you're using at World Reader? We have an incredible um, technology and operations team. It's our product team, and they are incredibly responsive. Um, and, you know, launching in the United States, there is uh, some learning, you know, we when we first launched in Oklahoma City, um, 
we immediately were responsive to getting around firewalls or making it accessible for young children, kindergartners, not to have to type anything in, but having, you know, either a QR code or a symbol to come up. Um, but our app is updated, you know, regularly. We have a tech team that's constantly doing this evalu evaluative and iterative process um, of looking at how we serve. Um, because we're global, we work on a, several different platforms. So we work on feature phones, which are just sort of a step below smartphones that you know we find more common in the United States. Um, there are a couple of operating systems that we work on. With our launch in the United States, we realized we needed to be able to work on Chromebooks as well as on phones, mobile devices in the home. But if we were going to partner with schools, we needed to meet them where they were with devices. And so um, I've you know, been lucky enough to be part of World Reader for about five months now. And in that time, we've released a Chromebook version. We've released an iPad or tablet version. Um, we're constantly having a, a pipeline where we go back and look at what what our customers are saying and what our partners are saying that they need um, and being very responsive. So I am super proud, but also super impressed with the responsiveness of our tech team. And we, you know, it's not like me having to moderate. I will mention to the tech team that there's, you know, possibly an issue or a question and they're immediately on the phone or Skyping from across the world um, because most of them are based in Spain actually um, and solving problems just very, very quickly. Which you know, and then my work with reading in motion, your team was very much like that as well. Yeah, we try to be as responsive as possible. There's always new things that crop up. And some of the things are actually outside of the application itself. And <laughs> it's like right. that's out of our control, but we have to respond because, you know, uh, devices are upgrading and operating systems are upgrading and servers are upgrading. And um, the tech has to work inside of that ecosystem. Exactly. Yeah. And two, once you take a product and you launch it from, you know, your small test pilot to uh, the world or to a global or to a nation, you have thousands more people using it in scenarios that you may or may not have predicted. And so that feedback is, I'm a curious person, so I always find that really interesting. Um, but that feedback is always needed to take you to the next level. But that's, I think, sometimes when, especially when children are involved, because they're great at taking something that you think you have a plan for, and then they find the all the way other ways to use it. Um, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. absolutely, they do. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, so you said World Reader started in 2010. Is that right? Mm hmm. Yes. And they're global. So did they start global or did they start in a particular country? They so they started global, which you know it, here we don't often have that um, we don't often have that perspective where you start global and then you come back you bring your learning back to the United States. I have found it humbling, honestly, to be to learn from my colleagues and and other parts of the world in a way that you know I again as a curious you know very much a curious person who believes greatly in growth mindset. I've loved it's been one of my favorite parts of 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 this position, um, but they started in, um, I wanna say East Africa, uh, just because our CEO had a, uh, his you know, great, 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 great grandparents came from the area and had a close ties and really wanted to be part of a solution in that in the country um, and on the continent. And so the learning that we've had from working in East Africa, in West Africa that can work anywhere. We've really, you know, struggled, not struggled because we it's definitely we saw it as a, a learning challenge, but looked at the learning of how do you work in a country with very, very low connectivity or with very, you know, where you're accessing lower literacy levels in some cases, or where you don't have reliable connections to the internet or to self-service. Um, and how do you put hundreds of books in a child's hand in country in those countries? And so that's really been a lot of what's informed the offering that we have here. So that ability to work with very low connectivity, that ability to download books if you're at a hotspot and you need to download a week's worth of books on your phone, um, to make sure that if you're you know working with families or with a family who may have to divvy up the amount of data they have in a week so that each child is able to learn remotely, 
um, that you're not going to suck all the data out of their plan by just reading a book. So the fact that our books are designed specifically for those, you know, low data plans and specifically to be offline um, has really been a great way to launch in the United States because, you know, we can serve our rural partners. Um, we can serve the book deserts we find in urban areas. Um, and, you know, I'm always surprised that in a country um, with as much wealth as our country has, that there are huge swaths of this country that are cannot, not connected, um, that have, that struggle to be connected to the internet, that struggle with cell service. My parents, you know, you know, have, have very little cell service and have no cable, internet, anything like that. Um, and so it's, it's really, I think, been great to launch with that experience that we've gotten from other countries and brought here and been able to use with our, you know, our most vulnerable communities. Yes. So I moved to a rural part of Texas and my connectivity is not so strong. <laughs> um, so yeah, when you're in more rural areas, there's definitely still an issue. Um, but it was one of the things that we wanted to make sure uh, we, it was a factor because we run a tech company. So we wanted to make sure we had access. Um, being a human centered. Uh, oh, I think I lost you. We have. Oh, wait, I got you. Yay. Um, so you were talking a little bit about, you know, meeting people where they are, understanding the communities right. in which you're working in. And really, if you're serving the extremes, you're actually able to serve more people. Right. Um, we do a lot of that work when we're doing the, the strategy and design portion, um, because we use a human centered design approach, as you know, having worked with us before, um, before we even write a line of code. And really, before we even put pixels, you know, in there to really design the layouts of things, we're looking at where are these users? What is their access? Are they having to pay to download? Um, what are their potential data plans? What are the free options that we can give them? Um, we work with with local partners a lot of times. Well, I will say we work with nonprofits. Our nonprofit partners work with local partners within the communities that they're trying to reach. Um, because they understand their communities best and really know what the needs are. So we've encountered some really interesting challenges just having worked around the world. Like you said, you know, there are different challenges, whether you're, you know, working in East Africa or Southeast Asia or rural U.S. <laughs> right. Um, and so it, it varies from place to place. That's so true. It really does. And um, but I think, you know, thinking of the end, because we, we often think about our end user as well, which is the reader, um, I think being solution focused, but having these multiple experiences to pull from uh, really makes you better meet needs across the board. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I would say that the user, you know, your stakeholders are kind of multi-layered. We look at it a lot of times as the beneficiary really is the, the end user, the reader, right? Um, but there are other beneficiaries along the way. For example, uh, your partner organizations that need that data that you were talking about um, yeah. so that they can do their programs better and, and serve their communities better. Um, you've got internal team members that are actually beneficiaries as well that need information and data. Um, you've got donors as stakeholders also that you need to report to and, and gather data for. And so I would say that, you know, any system that you're looking at, you're kind of looking at the whole ecosystem of an organization and a program to really map the right information into what you're building and, and how you get information out of it. Absolutely. And we do a lot of that. And, you know, we think about what's our user journey from start to finish, you know, whether they were onboarding um, a, a program lead or whether we're onboarding someone on the ground that's going to lead uh, and be the resource for families. But we also think about the end user as uh, a parent or a child mm -hmm. who's going to be the books. Um, we do because we we um, meet the European data standards. So we take no personal data. We take no per personal collection. You don't have to register to use the app. So a child's in the app within two clicks, they're reading a story or a family within two clicks, they're reading a story. Um, but that was done on purpose that, you know, we're not going to be able to gather information, a lot of information, but we've removed a barrier for someone to mm -hmm. use to be to have access to the stories and to the literature and the reading experiences. But even when we onboard, um, being able to respond to partners' needs immediately 
um, how can they most quickly understand all the great parts of this program or how can they quickly understand um, and feel co confident in telling other people. Um, but like you say, as a nonprofit, you have to think about, you know, we raise funds to offset the costs for our partners. So how can we also report to donors so that they can see that, you know, and I think that's becoming the norm now in the nonprofit space is that donors will have hard data um, to be able to say that what they support works, um, mm -hmm. you know, because we all want to make positive change, but now be able to go back and prove that you've made positive change, I think is a really great tool. Yeah, and the great thing about technology is some of that data, depending on how you implement it, you were talking about dashboards earlier, can be near real time. Right. Um, you can have that information pretty quickly, um, right. depending on on how you're collecting data. And you were saying, you know, you're not you're you're meeting the data standards and the and the privacy uh, policies. However, um, are you collecting aggregate de data in those areas so that you know that a child read a book, but you don't know which child. Right, exactly. Even when we, in some of the other countries, we track um, child level reading or child level, like how much they've read, but we never know the, like who, we give a set of codes to um, the teacher. We never, it's very anonymized. We, you know, never know who the name that goes with the code. Um, so we're, we are very, very careful to make sure we adhere to the highest level of those standards um, on data for especially when you're involved with children you have to be very particular and as you should um yes about what you're gathering and how you know you're using it but we're very um right now in the united states we do site level data so we don't even go that far and like i said we don't require anyone to you know a user to register to um to use the app so we do work with our partners on their log frames um just the, their framework uh, so we do provide some information there, but as far as the reader is concerned, we, you know, we also never reach out to someone who may be using the app to privately um, solicit nothing like that. So it's very much a service of, I would say on the part of our board and our CEO, it's very much a service of love that, you know, we believe so strongly in bringing this literacy resource out. Mm -hmm. Well, even beyond GDPR and European data laws, there's also, you know, FERPA laws here in the U.S. about, you know, student information, youth information, um, private information when you're talking about uh, children. So. Absolutely. Absolutely. And yeah, so we have to know those and be very careful, too, when we build things with our partners. Exactly. Um, yeah. And it's hard. It's nice oh, go to ahead. And luckily, it's easy to, you know, there are courses, I think, on ed.gov, there are courses to go through and, and make sure that you're absorbing that. But you're right, it is a, uh, adds a layer of complexity mm -hmm. you have to, you have to factor in. Yeah, I will say that it's hard, even in the project that we worked together previously with Reading in Motion, it's because mm -hmm. the way that we got information um, didn't necessarily al allow us to to see data in a certain way, you know? Um, and so it was, it was challenging to make sure that there was uh, security in place and privacy in place and uh, not exposing certain amounts of data, but then collecting the right things and mapping it to the right student and to the right classroom and to the right teacher. Um, it's a challenge for sure. Yeah. yeah, but you have to do it. I mean, it's, it's the, mm -hmm. it's Thing to do it's the law um but yeah absolutely absolutely it does matter the complexity mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. all right well i think that's about the time that we have today i'm glad you were able to hop back on <laughs> despite technology challenges um i really enjoyed this and you know this is one of my my passion topics too so happy to have this conversation with you me too. It's great to talk to you. It's great to work with you again and see you again. And um, again, I, I'll thank you for having me. Love talking about technology, literacy, the combination of the two and um, really how we can, the technology allows all of us to meet the needs of more people and more children, bring our services. So thank you. Thank you. And I'm looking forward to sharing this out with our community as an additional resource for them. Us too. Absolutely. And we're always happy to talk about, you know, how to get the collection out to your users or your, your partners. So more than always willing to have those conversations. 
Oh, so speaking of that, I believe uh, one URL you haven't shared with us is how do parents and organizations use your tool? That URL, could you give that to us? Absolutely. So it's bebooksmart.org. Um, they can go on. That's the free collection. And then we can always, you know, you can always get in touch with us. We have a really great website, worldreader.org. Um, is the general website, but bebooksmart.org gets you to the free collection. And like I say, we are having a phenomenal, wonderfully exciting collection on the app. Um, it's a great collection on there now, but it will be bilingual June 1st. And so really excited about that resource for families. That is super exciting. And how amazing that you're get, opening that up a little bit to, during the summer. So absolutely, thank absolutely. you for all that you're doing. Sure, thank you. I enjoyed this, thank you. Cause Labs can help you grow positive impact. Let us know if you have a new project that could use a strategic partner. 